Welcome everyone. We will wait a couple minutes before we get started. We just want to make sure everyone has a chance to get themselves to the right place, find the link, get into the Zoom. Uh, I know we've all become experts in Zoom, but uh, we don't want to miss anybody as we get going tonight. My name is Courtney. I'll introduce myself a little further um, in just a minute, but I am here representing the Office of Admission at Occidental. I'm going to be joined by some amazing panelists. I'm really, really excited about the conversation we're going to be having tonight. It's also just really exciting to get to connect with the families of students who are applying to Oxy this year. I feel like we often don't get to meet you or answer your questions until later on in the process. And so I hope this is helpful for you, especially as you're supporting them. Many of you might have students actually filling out applications in the coming weeks or using the coming holiday and winter breaks to really dive into the college process. So hopefully this is a helpful resource. Uh, using Zoom tonight, there's some features I want to point out and make sure you know how to take advantage of. If you have questions throughout the session, you can type them into that Q&A feature. So if you go to the bottom row of your Zoom screen, you'll see the option for Q&A. I'm actually joined by a few admission officers who are working behind the scenes in addition to our panelists. They will be making sure that we share links with you in the chat as we go. We'll also keep an eye on the Q&A and can help answer questions. Um, again, just to make sure that this is as meaningful, uh, helpful for you as possible in the next hour. We are recording this session. So another hopeful, helpful thing. You don't have to try and memorize or take frantic notes of everything we've shared. You will be able to refer to this recording. We will actually post it on our website. On the Occidental website, we do have a page within the admission section specifically for the parents and families of our prospective students. So a great resource that I definitely want to direct you to, but also where you will find this recording. We'll send it out in an email to you as well since you registered so that you have direct access to what we shared tonight. Um, again, this is an exciting chance to connect with the families of students who really might be applying to Oxy this year if they haven't already. Uh, we did have our first early decision application round on November 15th. Our second early decision application round is January 10th, and our regular decision application round is also January 10th. For students who have applied for that first early decision round, we will actually be releasing their admission decisions next week. So that's not any information we can give you in the chat or the Q&A tonight, but you can be looking forward to receiving those responses from us. Um, students who apply to the second early decision round will receive their decisions in February, and students who apply regular decision will receive their decisions in March. Now, again, my name is Courtney. I am the Senior Associate Dean and one of the Directors of Admission here at Occidental. I'm also a graduate of Occidental myself. I'm a very, very proud graduate and happy to be someone who gets to represent the Oxy experience and answer your questions. I am joining you tonight from my office in admission, which is a winter wonderland this time of year and certainly a place that makes reading lots of applications a little more cheery as we get to do it under the lights and the tinsel. So if you're wondering about the decor around me. I'm excited tonight specifically because our panel is going to focus on what Oxy offers in terms of our academic and holistic experience, but also why we think these offerings are so valuable. Um, and so with that, I'm going to invite my panelists to go ahead and join me on camera, and I will ask them to introduce themselves to all of you, share who they are, what department they're representing, um, and then we're going to dive in some, I think, really meaningful conversations. Um, so Ed, why don't you get us started with an introduction? Oh, and you'll just have to unmute real quick. There we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Ed Johnson. I'm the Director of Advising here at Occidental, as well as the coordinator of our core program, which includes both our first year seminars and our general education requirements. Uh, and in what spare time I have left, I am a faculty member in the music department where I teach courses in music history. Which, you know, just teaching courses in your spare time, not something the rest of us necessarily can do. So we're really, really grateful for Ed. He can speak a lot about not only the advising our students receive, but also what the experience is like in the classroom as someone who is in the classroom himself. Now, Jamila. 
Hello there, my name is Jamila Chambers and I'm the Executive Director at the Hamitman Career Center. So our Career Services Department is responsible for preparing students for life after OXY, uh, whether that be through career education and curriculum and exposure to immersive and experiential learning opportunities through internships and job opportunities that help prepare them for the world of work. So I'm happy to talk more about that uh, throughout the course of this discussion. I'm just so proud of the ways that Oxy connects students to really using the skills that they build while they are here on campus with what they are doing after Oxy. Thank you for joining us, Jamila. Asia. Hello, my name is Asia Cook. I am the Assistant Director for Residence Education and Housing Services, and I am uh, I have the opportunity to lead our resident directors and our RAs to really create a immersive community experience for all of our residents who live when, with us in the residence halls. And as you all will hopefully see tonight, Oxy being a residential campus is really key to who we are as a community. It's something we take great value in. We know our students are learning from each other outside of the classroom, but also building community together. So I'm just really grateful to Asia for joining us tonight to be able to represent that part of the experience. So getting into some content here, because first and foremost, Oxy is a college of the liberal arts and sciences, which means that our students end up spending as much time in classes outside of their major as they do in their specific department. And one of the ways they access other areas of study is through our core program. So Ed, would you mind just explaining to everyone what are the core requirements and what are the skills that students build because of the breadth of the curriculum at Oxy? Sure. So our core requirements are similar to some of the, the general education requirements that you'll see at other schools that have liberal arts um, curricula, although of course we have a bit of an oxy twist on some of them. Uh, so all students need to take courses in a variety of areas that kind of ensures that they get uh, a well-rounded education, also they, they get to really experience the liberal arts, that no matter what their major is, you know, obviously they'll get the expertise, that deep dive in a subject through their major, but they'll also have the chance to you know, sample a wide variety of fields. So our core requirements start with what we call the culture and arts requirements. So there's a course in US diversity, which is exactly what it sounds like, uh, a course that focuses on some part of the US or the whole US and different issues that might relate to equity, uh, culture, diversity, um, inclusion. Uh, courses in regional focus, any part of the world that's not the US, global connections, so different parts of the world and how they interact. Uh, a course that focuses primarily on the time period before the year 1800, uh, a course in the arts. And some of those can actually overlap. You could have a, a jazz history course, for instance, that could be a US diversity and a fine arts course at the same time. And those aren't specific courses. Those are categories that are represented by courses all across the curriculum. So students have dozens, if not hundreds of choices for each of those requirements. All students have to take two different courses in math or science, and there's a wide range of courses there. So whether a student is really interested in STEM fields and wants to dive right in with a chemistry class, or whether they're really interested in just kind of getting an introduction to a subject like, I don't know, marine biology, that, that's really accessible to all students and might uh, be something that they've always wondered about and want to learn a little bit more. Uh, they all have to take a course in lab science as well. So that's a course that has a separate lab component, which could be a field trip in the course of a case of geology, could be um, lab hours where they get um, help uh, coding, if it's an introduction to computer science, or it could be a traditional lab in some of the other sciences. Uh, finally, all students need to have uh, language proficiency equivalent to two semesters of college study. So if a student's coming in and they already have advanced proficiency in language, they might be able to test completely out of that requirement. Um, if they have a little bit of background in language from high school, they maybe would jump right into the second semester and that would be it. Or if they want to try a language for, from scratch, you know, they, they want to study Japanese and that wasn't an option in their high school, they just take two semesters and they'd be finished. Uh, we also use AP scores and IB scores to fulfill that requirement. So there's plenty of options. And so what do you think are the main skills then, being in courses that offer so many different topics to be exploring and that may be related to your major or not? How do you think our students are really kind of building a skill set? Absolutely. So one of the things that I've noticed in my 11 years at Occidental is that our students tend to be very much um, interested in connections between areas, right? We have students that are incredibly passionate about 
you know, the area that they end up majoring in. But it's very rare to find a student that doesn't have a secondary area or five secondary areas that they also are interested in connecting. And so the core requirements give students that chance to get that, that breadth and to, to explore different areas. Sometimes students go in thinking they have a pretty good sense of what their interests are. And then after taking a course their first year that was just going to be to fulfill a core, that ends up being their major or a minor. Um, I hear that story constantly. And so I do think that exposure to a, a lot of different fields, many of which they might not have ever had a chance to explore in high school, is really valuable. And it also gives you um, the opportunity to work with many different faculty members across the, the college. You'll have different teaching styles, you'll have different um, you know, ideas about how to introduce students to the content of the class. So you know, all in all, it's really about variety, about having that, that, that breadth and that strong foundation that's going to be useful for no matter what their career is going to be. Absolutely. And I just think seeing how the core is reflected, also a reflection of the values of the college as a whole, like Oxy's four cornerstones, the mission of the college, we define ourselves as being like committed to excellence, equity, community, and service. And so the fact that diversity and culture and language and regions, all of these even play into the core requirements, I think is so reflective of that. And you know, I forgot to mention two of the most important core requirements, which are the first year seminars. Um, ironically, I spent four hours this morning in a workshop with first year seminar instructors where we talked about all the great things we we're planning for the spring semester. So it's, I think my brain is just so obvious that I didn't mention it, but we have a first year seminar program. So all first year students take a seminar in their fall and their spring. They're small, so they're no more than 16 students per section. They are with faculty that are really, really passionate about both their own topics, but also about making sure that students have the skills they need to succeed at college. So they focus on writing skills development, critical thinking, engaging with different kinds of texts, which could be actual texts or could be movies, could be working with data sets, a variety of things. And they're taught by faculty in all the different disciplines. So we have some that are science themed, some that are music, some that are literature, some that are social sciences all over the place and students get to decide which ones they want to pursue. And so that's something that is very much part of our first year experience. And introduces our students to research really early on, which is something they have access to throughout their four years at Oxy. Now, going back to the conversation about kind of our mission, uh, who we are as a community and the diversity of our community, I am incredibly proud of the fact that Oxy is one of the most diverse liberal arts colleges in the country. 46% of the US citizens who attend Oxy identify as ethnicities other than white. And when you include our international citizens, you'll find that half of our student, student body identifies as students of color. Students also come to Oxy from 48 states and 27 countries. They represent an incredible range of languages, religions, orientations, and identities. And so as a result, um, as we mentioned before, Oxy students are really learning as much from each other as they are in the classroom as well. One of the main ways I think that that community is really enhanced is through residential life, especially since Oxy requires all students to live on campus for the first three years. So Asia, turning to you, can you describe the way that housing works at Oxy? So how do new students get housing? How do returning students get housing? And maybe provide an example of some of the ways that students really engage in the programming in our residence halls that help build community. Yes, thank you so much. So you are absolutely correct. For all of the students who um, we have living on campus, we have a three year live on requirement. Uh, and that is because this is truly a residential living experience for our students. A lot of our students, when they come in for the first year, they are placed in first year residential communities. And so these communities are really geared towards community building, exploration, and because a lot of our students are from all over, um, we really are trying to make sure that they are not only getting familiar with Oxy, but that they are also getting familiar with LA because there's so much to offer. So the first year, it's really about that community building, getting to know your neighbor, getting to know your neighborhood. And then when they return for their subsequent years to live on campus with us, uh, they are placed in upper division halls. And so those upper division communities, they are more geared towards um, building out opportunities to get students connected to resources 
on campus. And so a lot of the students who do live with us, who are a part of our upper division communities, they are wanting uh, our campus resources to come into the residence hall, uh, such as the career center, um, to do a lot of programming um, in the halls to um, make it more accessible, especially after hours when students are outside of class. Another uh, way that students can get involved in the residential community is by themed living communities or called TLCs affectionately. And these communities are specialized based off of interest or affinity, and it is based off of application. So all students, uh, when you get your wonderful acceptance and you're like, Oxy is it for me, um, we have an application, a housing application process that is rolled out um, in late um, winter. And then you get to um, apply through the application process in terms of both the themed living community, as well as the uh, regular placement for the fall. You go, there's a whole process. The application is very extensive to make sure that you are matched as closely to preference needs as much as possible. Uh, however, um, it's really important that you get it done early so that way placement is um, rolled out right around uh, the end of summer. So can you, just because of our, our family members might be asking some of those practical questions, um, could you explain specifically then how the application process works for the first year students and how they're matched with a roommate? Um, I love that Oxy has first year students living in halls together. I think it is such a great just kind of anchor and building community and friendships because you you look out your door and you know everyone is new, right? We're all starting together. None of us know anybody. It's easy to then just jump in and get connected. Um, but Oxy also does an amazing job of putting together roommates. So just to, to brag about that, I'd love for Asia to, to describe that. Yes, um, very humble brag about <laughs> our matching process um, because we really uh, try to be very intentional about our matching process. So the application is more than just what type of living community that you want to be in that is part of the process. So it's very much so like, hey, here are 16 residential communities that we have on campus. Um, please pick one. <laughs> um, but it also goes into what is your needs. And so if you do have housing accommodations, um, we try to prioritize that and take that into consideration first. Then uh, in that application is also what are your living preferences? So we really try to tell students when you do fill out your housing application that you do be very honest of how you live. So we, I tell students all the time, prospective students of like, if you know that you come home and you step out of your clothes, please put that in the housing application process and not aspirational that you are very clean and very tidy because to surprise of a lot of people, there are people that are very honest and they say, hey, I'm messy. And they are had the opportunity to put that in the housing application. Once um, we do have housing, the housing application that you put your housing preferences, then uh, really we have um, a team that really goes to be very intentional based off of um, your that what was presented on the application, if you have uh, similar needs, if you are uh, coming from a similar area. I'm originally from New York, so we try to be really intentional about that, try to put people together um, and really go down the list. Um, and we make matches based off of that. Another thing is that if you or your student is coming um, and they have a friend or they met someone online that they really vibed with and they're like, hey, I really want to um, room with this person or match with this person, there is an opportunity in the housing application for both people to match with each other and that they will be put in a room together. 
Absolutely. But don't worry, families, that's not the norm. Like we know most people don't know each other coming to Oxy because again, we're coming from so many different places and perspectives. Um, but it is always really nice to know that if you had that connection in advance, that's certainly something we can honor. Um, I lived on campus all four years. Absolutely critical piece of my Oxy experience, something that I look back on and really, really value. Um, but I don't want to step away from the fact that at Oxy, it's really as important to us that students not only have a meaningful four-year experience, but that they are building the schools and experience, skills and experiences that they need to be successful after they graduate at Oxy. We believe the value of an Oxy education should be just as apparent five years after you are at Oxy. Oxy, right, in that job interview or that grad school presentation or whatever else you might be involved in, as it was when you were using the skills for the research presentations, um, even on campus as a student. So I am so impressed by Oxy's career services, which is why I've invited Jamila here tonight. I'd love for you, Jamila, just to describe in a little more depth the kind of career education and counseling services that the Hamitman Career Center provides and how a student connects with you throughout all of the four years. Wow, I'm so excited to talk about that. And, and, and you can tell Courtney and I have similar personalities. I want to start with where Ed uh, kicked us off, um, really talking about how we engage with first year students from the beginning. It starts in rooms just like this. Our admissions team does an amazing job of making sure that not, not only do we have the opportunity to connect with parents, families and students upon arrival at campus, but we have an opportunity to really be a part of the conversation from a career perspective from the beginning. And that shows up in a variety of different ways. Number one, we are physically located on this residential campus in between our main dormitory area and the food. So our students physically have to walk past the Hamitman Career Center on their way to campus dining every single day and literally have to physically trip over our advertising and marketing about the services and resources that are available to them. Uh, we joke and exaggerate about that. We are physically located in that space, but that shows you the importance that the college has placed and the campus has placed on career outcomes. Our first point of engagement is with students as a part of new student orientation. We have two main points of connection uh, with them in that capacity. Um, one is with first year financial aid eligible students. We connect with them to talk to them about uh, on campus employment opportunities for them that mm -hmm. are administrated from the Hamidman Career Center and from our office. And then we also meet with the general population as a part of new student orientation to not only talk about the resources that are available in career services, but the Hamidman Career Center houses three different uh, outcomes-based departments. So our Director of National and International Fellowships, Jennifer Locke, is physically housed in the Hamidman Career Center. And our Director of Pre-Health Advising, Kat Wang, also physically sits uh, in our office as well. So from a student perspective, uh, they can have a one-stop shop experience uh, to have discussions regarding outcomes in one physical place on campus. We also have our um, uh, a Professor uh, Marisol Leon that is our pre-law advisor. She is an, an active faculty member on campus, does not sit in our office for obvious reasons because she is teaching, but uh, also works very closely with our office as well. So for for first year students, talking about that career education curriculum, for first year students, um, we have what we call HCC 101, which is Introduction to Career Services. That is the entry point of our curriculum, which is simply uh, discussing and sharing with students how to utilize the career services resources on campus, how to make appointments with uh, advisors, how to utilize the physical space that is in our office, which is not only where we have one-on-one -on -one appointments with uh, students, where we have um, over 150 employer engagement events a year physically in our office, but we also have interview rooms that students can uh, rent to uh, have Zoom calls or physical interviews with uh, employers and those that are considering them for different opportunities that allow them to utilize that physical space for all of their uh, career development needs. And so we introduce that curriculum to students in a variety of ways. One, through our summer uh, multicultural summer institute 
Institute or MSI. They'll drop a link in the chat about that program if you hadn't heard about it already, but we engage with, with students over the summer in that capacity. Uh, Ed mentioned earlier the first year seminars. There are several faculty members that will have as a part of the first year seminar a tour uh, of our office participation in that HCC 101 so that students get the opportunity to just have that exposure really early on. The benefit of that uh, is that really our students have eight semesters and three summers to maximize their experience at Occidental. And so we want to, in a very systematic way, in a way that's natural, give them the exposure to the office so it's not foreign or it's not something that's strange. It's just something that I do in the same way that I take advantage of other resources across campus, taking advantage of career uh, center resources is something that I just do as a part of my um, uh, experience at Occidental. Um, for first years and sophomores, uh, we transition them into uh, what we call HCC 102, which is our career exploration phase, talking to students about how they have those initial career discernment conversations, which also aligns uh, with the same time that they're making decisions about their major. And then for our juniors and seniors, we really have them start to heavily focus on uh, getting those experiential learning opportunities through internships and other opportunities Communities that I'll uh, emphasize, place a, a bit of an emphasis on in just a moment, but having those conversations with them because those are the students that are really getting ready to transition uh, into life after Oxy. And so we really want to have that, have them um, get that exposure in that capacity. What I will say uh, throughout all of this is that we really encourage students, and Ed talked earlier about exposure, we really encourage students to, in, in a variety of ways, get exposure to all of the resources that are available across campus, and we help them translate those resources and those experiences into helping them prepare for the world of work. And this is what I mean. Many times parents will ask questions like, well, what is it that an Occidental College student does that helps prepare them? And if I had to give you a profile of that student, um, they've already, number one, has what it takes. They're considering Occidental. And so they come with a certain amount of curiosity, a certain amount of passion, um, a, a desire to be a part of this community. There's already that curiosity there. And then they will couple that and pair that with what happens academically, with being in small classroom sizes, with being engaged with faculty members one-on-one, -on -one, with having the opportunity to get exposed to speakers and different resources that are, are really gonna be transformational in providing them with that exposure. And then there's some unique things that happen at Occidental. Uh, there's the Intern LA program, and Ruby, I'm gonna ask you to drop that in the chat, which is our summer funded internship program that is offered from our office, which offers exclusive internships internship opportunities just to Occidental College students. And as unique as that program is, we have our uh, students that participate in our undergraduate research. There are students that will uh, participate in campaign semester. There are students that will participate in our UN program. There are students that will be RAs on campus uh, as a part of our, our, our residential community. There are students that will take advantage of learning and uh, on-campus student employment like the Writing Center, and that might translate them into opportunities uh, to become grant writers, <laughs> to become uh, 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 have utilized that expertise in other areas. Uh, we particularly go after that population. Ed, I'm looking at you for script development opportunities that we have coming up. And so our job is to really take all of those experiences and allow students to be able to translate them into a set of skills and a set of competencies that they are able to utilize in the world of work. Um, so that's how that career, uh, uh, career education part works. It's all of the workshops, all of the things, but it's really about closing that exposure gap. And then we talked about the employers and Courtney, I'm gonna put myself on mute in just a second because I'm looking at the clock. I know we wanna get to questions and all that. Um, but our philosophy and our uh, goal with bringing employers to campus is making sure that employers that come on campus, and I mentioned we have over 150 of them that do that annually, have active jobs and internships for Oxy students. And I will repeat that. Um, we do not have any employers that come to campus that don't have a live opportunity. And so I tell our students early on, and even our first year students, sophomore year gets here really quick, and these are the actual recruiters. 
These are the actual hiring managers. These are the people that are going to pull your resume out of that uh, applicant tracking system. Um, so we want to make sure that our students are uh, getting that opportunity to have that exposure to employers very early to hear about uh, the skills and competencies that they're looking for in candidates, to ask questions, and to be able to take advantage of those opportunities because we're bringing them right to campus um, and we'll have the opportunity to do so in our biggest event in that capacity is our spring career fair, which is coming up uh, February 23rd, 2023. So with that, <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Courtney and then I think we'll open it up for any questions. So this yes, is great. <laughs> thank you, Jamila. I'm gonna ask just a couple more questions. One thing that you mentioned that I really wanna dive into are these kind of high level programs that Oxy students are building skills at and our senior comprehensive requirement is one of those programs. It's actually rated top 12 of all colleges around the country as one of the top institutions with stellar examples of senior capstones. And the fact that our students do just such a deep dive in their area of expertise really translates into what they're going to do after Oxy. So Ed, I'd love for you just to explain senior comprehensive comps, as we call it. Um, different departments implement this in different ways. Um, what should our families know about that? Oh, and of course, it looks like Ed cut out right as we went to him for questions. Uh, okay, right. there you are. My, my webcam sometimes does that. Um, yeah, so comps are a big part of the, the Ox experience, especially for students in their junior and their senior years. Uh, it, it's short for comprehensive exam. That's There was a time decades ago where there was an actual kind of massive exam that students had to take to finish their, their, their degree. Uh, in the interceding decades, it's changed into something, I think, much more exciting. Um, still still a, big, uh, a, a, a big experience, but essentially different departments, different fields have adapted the requirement out of being an exam into being some sort of capstone uh, that, that really depends on the actual thing. So for, you know, humanities departments, oftentimes it's a, a paper and a presentation. You know, it could be something that's research intensive or more analytical uh, in the sciences. Oftentimes it involves doing lab work, experimentation. In the arts, it's often um, a performance or a portfolio of works. Uh, we have departments where there's a lot of community-based learning work. So it might be a project that involves working closely with a community group or, or uh, different um, organizations. Uh, I was looking through um, some of the, the recent projects that students have done. And it's, it's, they're so exciting. You know, we, every spring, most of them happen in the spring of the senior year. Sometimes they happen in the fall. Um, and in many departments, they're actually preparing for their, their comps in the junior year. Kind of at the end of the junior year, they might be thinking about the topics, uh, putting in proposals, working closely with faculty members to decide what's a good, a good way of presenting it. And then through the senior year, we get emails going out to the whole community from different departments. Um, advertising their students' works. Usually there's some sort of public component, whether it's a presentation, sometimes, let's say for our media arts and cultures program, it could be film screenings of student films in the theater department. It could be uh, performances of student directed or written plays. Um, it's all over the place. So I was just looking at some of the ones that stuck out to me just from the last you know, few months. I saw there we had a, a senior who did work in the um, comparative literature uh, and cultures department. Uh, who who wrote a a, 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 a large-scale project called The World is a Fable on Fabulation as a Narrative Modality. Um, then we had a cognitive science project called Bridging the Gap Between Mind and Technology, um, a, a project that was an interdisciplinary literature and music project called John Coltrane and Free Jazz as Antidote to the Apocalypse. Um, I know since I teach in music that you know, we have students in music production who are putting together portfolios of really impressive musical works. We have performers who are giving recitals or performances of their um, their compositions. I was thrilled to go to one of my students' recitals last May or late April, uh, where he wrote a bassoon concerto um, that was performed in one of our beautiful spaces in, in Booth Hall. Um, and I saw a, 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 a great comps presentation. I had to look up the title, Micro Fashion Designing, an Examination of Sustainable Garment Production and Fast Fashion Alternatives in the uh, Urban and, and Environmental Policy Department. And so again, it, it varies enormously depending on the student's field, whether it's something that's gonna be a research project, 
a performance, uh, a more personal or a more community engaged thing. There's a lot of different directions students can go into. Um, but I think that the common denominator is that it's usually a really exciting thing for the student. It's stressful for a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Um, but when they're done, they have that accomplishment. It's something they can talk about with prospective employers. They can list on their CV or resume if they want. Um, and it's something that they can look at as a way, as a kind of culmination, an encapsulation of a lot of what they've learned over the course of four years. Well, and not only are the students excited about it, as are we, and you can tell even just nodding along how I think amazing these topics are, but the campus gets excited about this. And something I really love about Oxy, um, not only the holistic approach to campus life, but the way our students engage with each other, is there is mu as much enthusiasm about going to see your friend's comps presentation as there is going to see their team play or their dance performance. This is a school where all of these pieces encompass student life. There's not like a single factor that drives Oxy school spirit. Like everyone is in the room for each other. In fact, I think that's what drives Oxy spirit, that the students have relationships relationships with each other and what they want to be supporting their friends, kind of showing up in those spaces. So Azer, since housing is part of our Division of Student Affairs, um, I don't want to ask you to try to speak for the entire Division of Student Affairs, but as a college that is so invested in that holistic experience, could you maybe even just provide a kind of list of your fellow departments, like who else is working towards kind of helping build that community on campus? Absolutely. So um, the Office of Residential Education and Housing Services is a hub um, that a lot of students go, especially because um, we're the students home and they come to us with like, hey, you know, I know you're housing, but I don't know this person. Can you connect me? <laughs> um, so with that, we're very much so um, connecting with campus partners such as uh, the student leadership, uh, we affectionately call it SLICE, um, office that is uh, located very centrally on campus underneath the marketplace. Um, and so that is um, where students really go to get connected with campus engagement overall. So they do a lot of the large scale programming um, in at Oxy. Um, we are also very connected with the Office of um, Disability Services. And so they work primarily with um, uh, making sure that all students have the appropriate accommodations that they need to be uh, to sustain uh, themselves at Oxy. And so we really are um, very positive in getting the uh, appropriate accommodations that all students need. So please destigmatize, release. Um, and if you feel that you qualify, if the student is going through the process of getting testing or needing the accommodation, sooner rather than later, go through that office. Um, so they are very all encompassing. Then um, we are also connected with the Intercultural um, Community Center um, the, or the ICC. And so students of all different backgrounds um, go there and they do a lot of our um, community outreach to our students of color. Um, and they have a really nice hub, a really wonderful office and a community and event space that our students go to. They kind of like relax there, collect there. Um, and then when it um, when students really want to just um, collect um, based off of their affinity group and affinity spaces, they really use the uh, ICC offices to kind of collect and collaborate there. Um, and then the last office that is at the top of my uh, head is the um, interfaith. Uh, center, um, which is also right next to the library on campus. So a lot of our students, we do a lot of programming to celebrate all different faiths and backgrounds and celebrate all different religious holidays um, that is celebrated for all students. We have a variety of prayer rooms um, that is in that center as well. Um, and the director of the Interfaith Center, um, she is very much so involved in getting students to come in to make sure that uh, if they would like that they can have a free and open space um, to practice um, their uh, spirituality. Um, and then the last center that I definitely want to highlight is um, the Veterans uh, Office. Um, it is a relatively 
a newer center where we in, uh, installed a, a, a full-time professional staff member there um, and also uh, having uh, some housing options for our veterans um, to come into um, campus and really get support of what it means to matriculate um, back into civilian life, back into um, going back to college and the struggles with that. And so they have a lot of programming and support um, dedicated to um, veterans and supporting veterans, whether the veterans are 18 <laughs> or the veterans are uh, non-traditionally aged college students. So those are my student affairs highlights. Um, that I will um, pause there, um, but I can go on and on about a lot of the great opportunities that Student Affairs has. Absolutely. Thank you, Asia. And really, the truth is, I could ask any one of you to come and join me for a whole hour just to talk about the areas that you work in because they are so valuable. Um, but that is also why it's exciting to get to have you all together in one place. Now, another really engaged community that I just want to highlight before we get to any final questions is our alumni network. Um, you know, this is a small school. There's only 2,000 students on campus at a time, and yet there is a lot of spirit and passion um, for this, what is such a meaningful time at Oxy, and that's really shared. In fact, I work with alumni volunteers for decades and decades out of Oxy and just find so many things in common about why Oxy was such a special place for them as it is even for our students who are here now. Now, Jamila, you probably get the opportunity most out of this group to also hear from alumni and see how they connect with students. And could you maybe just share some um, examples of how they stay involved through career services, maybe providing their support to students or even you know, some of the things students do after Oxy? Uh, yeah, so so a couple of things to, to note there for uh, Oxy students, once they graduate, our office provides services for them three years post back. So uh, a student can uh, then a young alum can spend uh, time in our office to whatever degree or frequency they want to for three years post-graduation. Um, after that component, there's a couple of different ways that alumni tend to engage with one another. Um, our, our Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement has a ton of resources, whether through affinity groups, whether through the uh, Alumni Board of Governors that has a careers component, um, or even uh, just connecting with one another in the LinkedIn group for alumni. Um, there are different opportunities for alumni to stay connected with one another, even connected with one another via industry components. And so there's a, a, a large way that that's connected. But our office really partners with alumni to help students bridge the gap between being in a classroom at Occidental and transitioning into a particular industry. Ed mentioned about our students being multi-passionate. They're interested in a variety of different disciplines. One of the most difficult questions that I get asked uh, as a career services professional is, I am majoring in X. Well, what job does that mean I should be able to do? And I give the most, uh, a great example I can think of, of of an Oxy student that was a history major at Occidental that is now uh, working for NASA JPL uh, uh, on, on some of their uh, exploratory projects and went from studying history to writing history uh, because that particular alum was such a good uh, researcher, writer, uh, and, and got hired for those particular skills. So who knew that a history major would be working in STEM? Them, but that's just how things are at Occidental. So we really utilize uh, our alumni in that capacity. And one of the events that just kind of stood out that happened this semester was our careers in gaming uh, uh, event, where we had a panel of about six Oxy alums that worked in gaming that had a variety of different majors. And they were talking to students about um, the intersection between computer science, music, media arts and culture, um, uh, writing, because there's a lot of script development in the, in the gaming industry, and uh, business and entrepreneurial endeavors within the careers in gaming. And, and 
really connecting the dots for students about the different points of intersections between those different industries. And so our alumni will come together and talk about and help to share uh, the ways in which students can go about doing that. Our alumni are also very instrumental in helping prepare students for some of those specific opportunities that I talked about. So. Um, if there is an Oxy alum that is a member of the team of one of those organizations, we will have that alum come in, meet with our students and talk to them about the application process, preparation therefore, how to brush up for the interview so that they can get those particular skills uh, set in place. And then we also utilize uh, our alumni and in particular, our most recent grads for helping our seniors in particular talk about those career discernment uh, and first steps after oxy questions because sometimes um, deciding where to take that first step after graduation is something that um, is a challenge or a roadblock for uh, students that are on, on the cusp of graduating and so utilizing alumni to help have that discussion with them is something that they partner with us greatly on um, and so it might be again that that one-on-one -on -one connection panel connection or through our events like that Careers in Gaming Day or our student and alumni networking night, we really want to make sure that uh, our alumni stay connected to current students um, because that is what helps them um, be more aspirational and then also helps students um, get more exposure to just the, the, the depth and breadth of opportunities that are available. Um, the interesting part is, is that there's careers that we know about today and uh, there are students that are quite frankly coming in that are going to be a part of the class of 2027. Yes, I said it, Courtney. Um, <laughs> class of 2027 that are going to have careers that don't exist today um, because that's how fast the world is changing and that's how dynamic uh, things are. And so our alumni are very critical uh, in, in helping our students navigate because they, they, they've been there and, um, and they, they serve as a roadmap for our students. And so we're appreciative of that. So much so that uh, a member of the alumni and parent engagement team is a liaison with our office and 50% of their job responsibility is connecting with career services and bridging that gap uh, between alumni and uh, students that are seeking those career opportunities. And so even from um, an investment perspective, that's how much the college uh, believes in that connection between our students and alumni, that it is someone's job on campus uh, to make that connection. And so we're grateful for that as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Jamila. Um, another, I just want to take a break and acknowledge again the other people who are in this Zoom with us. So I have two amazing colleagues working behind the scenes that I know have been doing a great job of sharing links and resources in the chat as we go and answering your questions. There's a few questions that they've uh, kind of highlighted that they thought would be helpful for us to discuss live. Um, and so I want to dive into um, a little bit more just about kind of the breakdown of majors um, and the programs that are at Oxy. We do have uh, over 45 different uh, routes that a student could, could be connected with in terms of our different academic offerings. So we are not going to be able in this session to discuss each of them. You know, I know there were some questions about marine biology and computer science. I would love for people to go on our website to check out the majors. There's so much amazing information there. I can point out, though, the most popular majors at Oxy tend to be economics, diplomacy and world affairs, biology and psychology. We're seeing a lot of growth and excitement about media arts and culture and music. So I think there's always a lot of fluidity there. The average class size at Oxy is just 18 students, and we have a nine to one student faculty ratio. Um, so you're going to see that students who come to Oxy are really, really diving in to these fields. Um, and thanks often to the core, getting to explore and figure out what they're going to major in. And everyone at Oxy technically does start undeclared. So you're not applying to your major, you're applying to the college as a whole. We love to know what the students are interested in studying because it helps us get to know them, but not because they need to be, you know, determining that before they enroll. Now, maybe this is, Ed, where we could tap you for your professor perspective. Um, and so just speaking about that classroom experience of a small class, um, can you give even just a, a quick description of what does that actually feel like to be in an Oxy classroom with so few students sitting at the table? Sure. I think, you know, one of the cornerstones is that our classes can be very interactive. Um, you know, especially with the, the smallest classes. So the first year seminars are at 16, sometimes smaller. 
um, you know, uh, as an instructor, I get to know my students' names within the first week or so of class. I see them often. I, you know, I'm very aware of, you know, people's strengths and weaknesses in their writing because we have, you know, so much time to interact. Um, I always meet individually with all of my students every semester just to check in. Usually when we have a project due or something, you know, early in that process, when they're kind of picking topics, we'll have one on one meetings in my office. It one establishes that they know how to find me. I want to make sure that they know that I'm here and that they can come back in office hours. Um, but it also is just a point for us just to kind of touch base. Oh, what are you working on? What are you interested in? What's going really well so far? Is there anything you're stuck on? And that's something that's just not possible when you have a really large class. Um, previous to coming to Occidental, I taught at an institution where uh, one of my classes had 450 students. And that is a vastly different experience. You know, I was up on a, a stage in a darkened you know, lecture hall and you know, had a giant screen behind me. I did my song and dance and you know, tried to keep people engaged. But I didn't get to know any of my students at all. And it was strange because for years after that, I'd be at you know, the grocery store at Costco and someone would come up and be like, you were my professor, I think. And they're like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. That doesn't happen in Rock Central. <laughs> I, I know who my students are from day one. Um, I keep in touch with them. I see them on the quad. We chat, we talk. And so I think that's a real asset of having a small college experience that you have that chance to build relationships that, you know, a couple years later, someone can reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I had such a great experience, you know, on that project, would you be feel like, you know, up to writing a letter of recommendation kind of reflects on what I did in your class? And I'll say, yeah, of course. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it. Um, and we really do value discussion and, and kind of critical engagement. And it's not, it is never about me saying, okay, you know, this is the stuff that you need to, you know, like absolutely memorize. I mean, at least in the classes I teach, you know, I'm really, really interested in knowing, okay, you read something provocative. What was your takeaway? Were there things that you were really convinced by? Are there things that you were a little skeptical about? Where would you push back on that? What, what are the things in here that you think could be done better? Or, or where are the areas that we think we need more research? What's missing? You know, so those are the kind of critical discussions that I think are much, much easier in a small classroom setting. Absolutely. And I just want to say it again, because there are even small colleges around the country where first year classes, first year seminars can be 50, 100 people. And so the fact that at Oxy, it's actually smaller than our average class size, like we intentionally make sure those first year classes are going to be built around the skills that our students are going to use for all of their time at Oxy, but also use them to start building relationships, um, which is just so valuable. Now, a question came in around Housing Asia that you can help me with. Um, just knowing that our first year students are living in doubles and triples for the most part, uh, we really reserve those single rooms for first year students who would require that for some sort of medical accommodation because we're so intentional about community and we want our students to be able to live with each other and learn from that experience. Um, there is some practicalness of how this comes about, certainly being a campus that is committed to housing people, we, we have to make the space. Um, there is a difference in costs in doubles and triples. Um, could you just maybe explain a little bit, Asia, of maybe the breakdown, how many of our first year students are living in which, um, and kind of how is that figured out? Absolutely. So I was thinking again at the question, um, and I don't want to uh, misspeak or misrepresent the exact numbers. So um, I would say um, I will be happy if that person wants to reach out to rehs uh, at oxy.edu um, or get in contact with our email so that way we can get a exact number um, to answer that question appropriately because I do not have that information on hand. However, I can speak that um, many of our students do live in either a double or a triple for that reason of we don't want students to be um, super isolated in their college going experience and um, COVID 
alone was very isolating. And so a lot of students have also demonstrated that they want to be with a roommate, they want to be with someone and had really positive outcomes from that. So we do our very best to put people in either a double or a triple room. Triples are mostly reserved for first year students. Um, and then it kind of trickles down um, to either a double or if you're very, very lucky, a single uh, as you are going up um, in your time here at Oxy. Um, the great thing about that is that similar to the small um, class sizes, we also make sure that our RAs have one-on-ones and intentional conversations with every single resident. So all of our RAs have meetings at the beginning of the year and throughout the semester with all of their residents just to check in, hey, how are you? How are you doing? If there are people that are homesick or things that they are happening, interpersonal things. Uh, our RAs are very quick to really pick up on um, just interpersonal dynamics. Um, and with that, they're able to really build a really strong community. So for the exact number and cost breakdown and the why, the why behind that, please feel free to send me or REHS an email and we'll be absolutely sure to get back to you because I don't want to misrepresent anything. Um, however, I am able to speak to the student experience and that um, it's intentional that we really want to focus on the camaraderie, the, the community building that um, we have for our students who are living with us in the residence halls. Absolutely. And I, I'm always impressed and inspired by the students who are choosing to live in triples, even in their sophomore and junior years, which I think speaks to the value of building community in that way. Um, so it doesn't seem like it's a stigma of like something you're stuck with. It's just another way to be connecting with your fellow students. And as my tour guides point out all the time, if Barack Obama could live in a triple when he was at Oxy, maybe there's something to it. You know, maybe there's a skill set here that you might refer to in your own life later on. Now, a follow-up question for you, Jamila, about all of these uh, employers offering internships and recruiting on campus. What's our geography of that? Since our students aren't all coming from LA, are we only working with employers who are recruiting in LA? Or are we finding that there are opportunities in other places as well? And, and so Courtney, I'm going to uh, tap, tap you if I miss some uh, admit cities. So uh, one thing that we do as students are transitioning out of Occidental is do what we call a first destination survey. And we really try to get an understanding of where our students land in terms of life after Oxy. And our uh, destination for our students after Occidental looks very similar to our admit cities. Um, so most of our students decide to stay in Southern California. There's another contingent and Northern California, uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, is, is within our top five. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, New York and Chicago kind of being uh, equally uh, connected there. I would say uh, uh, the Texas region it rounds it out and remote work has made uh, the top of the list. So I'm going to ask Jesse. I would just add, to drop, I was would, that? I would add DC. There's just in DC. So there you go. I, I, I say I say New York. I'm from California. Uh -huh. You have to forgive me, Asia. I say I, I, I say New York, and I'm just talking about the whole East Coast. All of a sudden, uh, that that's what happens when we take up the whole left coast. You know, it it, it just is a way where I, I refer to things. So I'm going to ask Jesse and Ruby to drop in the chat if you don't mind. On the Hamidman Career Center page, there is a copy of our annual report, oh, and they our have already shared report. that. Oh, there you go. There you go. Because that's how amazing they are in the chat. It's like the magic of the chat. Um, so within that annual report, you are able to get a, a list of the top cities where Oxy students go, some of the top industries, um, uh, average annual salary, things of that nature that kind of give you more uh, insight into the outcomes uh, portion of where our students end up. But it really mirrors very closely uh, our admit city. So uh, that's always a good uh, uh, indicator for us as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Jamila. Now we are out of time and I just cannot say thank you enough 
to my panelists and just spending their evening with us and answering these questions. Um, I'm sure you have more questions. So this is not to end a conversation with you all who have joined us tonight. This is hopefully a starting point. Um, we have shared links and resources. You can always reach out to admission as a starting place, like whether it's to follow up with housing or any of these other areas, we can always send you in the next direction of where you want to go to learn more. We really encourage encourage your students especially to be spending time getting to know our programs and our offices. But if there's any other way that we can support you as you support them in this application process, we know what a challenging time this is and that they are also relying on you. So we hope that we can um, help you be there for them. So thank you for being here tonight uh, or whatever time of day you are watching this session, whenever you watch it, as a reminder, we will send you this recording and really, really look forward to connecting with you all. So great. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone.